Hello everyone and welcome back to day 32 of Bitwise where we code the complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Um, so uh, originally we were supposed to do this stream the day before today. Uh, I had to move that due to personal obligations, but the code I was planning on doing on stream that day actually got, um, got checked in anyway. So I, I checked it in off stream. Um, and if you recall, that was uh, supposed to be the work on the expression evaluator. And, um, and so before we dive into today's topic, which is actually not related to the assembler, but uh, moving back to the simulator uh, to firm that up and add some more features, uh, I want to review those changes since there was supposed to be a stream topic. And unfortunately, it turned out to be about as simple as I was anticipating. And so there it won't be a whole lot to talk about. But um, yeah, expression evaluation. Um, so let's see here. Expression evaluation is pretty much what it sounds like. Um, it's the ability to parse and evaluate expressions during assembly time. And so um, the main entry point is just a function called parse expr. Um, and uh, the shape of the recursion and the individual functions that make up the recursion should be very familiar because it's the kind of thing we've done now several times. And in fact, I used the ion code as a template. I had it open in one window and more or less just copied the relevant parts because, I mean, there's nothing to it. It's kind of, at this point, should be completely rote for everyone. Um, and um, yeah, so um, one difference from the way we do it in ion is that if you look at the ion parser, which I guess I can bring up real quick, um, if you bring up the ion parser and look at the equivalent of some of this stuff, like this one, you can see ultimately the result of, of, of one of these parse functions uh, is to return a pointer to an AST node, which is what expr is, um, and that's how that works. In our case, the denotation of, par of, of a parse result is just a plain expr, and expr is just a, uh, a struct which can have two different kinds. Uh, an expression can either be a constant or an address. So these are basically like types, uh, or kind of like types, I guess, const qualifiers in this case, uh, or not even. No, I mean, but anyway, there's two different kinds of expression results. It can either be a constant, which is like the number five is a constant. And if you add one to five, you have six, that's also a constant. So it's a mathematical constant. Um, and then there's an address. And um, the most basic kind of address is if you refer to a label, Right in an expression context, that is an address, but you can also add, you know, four to an to an address, essentially doing pointer arithmetic, and um, and that will also be an address. So this is you can think of this kind of being like a type system for the expression evaluator. Um, you can see, yeah. Anyway, so uh, but other than that, it's pretty much what you've seen before. So you can see um, if you have a an integer literal that uh, denotes a constant. If you have a name then it does a lookup and depending on the kind of symbol associated with the name, there's a different kind of denotation. So in the case of a constant, you get a constant. In the case of a label, you get an address. Uh, if it hasn't been uh, defined to anything yet, it's assumed to be a forward reference to a label and so it just fills in a dummy value. Um, so that's the idea there. And um, uh, I said that there's a type system and one of the ways that, that shows up is that um, all the uh, all the arithmetic ops uh, or all the different expression operators can all be applied to constants, um, but some of them can also be applied to addresses, which is mimicking pointer arithmetic essentially. So you can and right now I don't do it for comparisons because I could do that, but it's not the most useful thing in an assembler. Maybe I'll add it later. But right now most things uh, can't be done to addresses, even where maybe C would allow it. Um, the, but the big thing where you really need um, address arithmetic, like pointer arithmetic is for addition and subtraction. And so you can see here, if you you can add a, a constant to an address in either order, and it does pointer arithmetic. And uh, also you can subtract, and this is maybe the more interesting case, I don't know if it's more interesting, but anyway, you can subtract two addresses and get a constant. Um, and uh, you can see here, there's a note here about the assumptions of what that entails, uh, or the assumptions behind that, which is that, um, in order for the difference between two address operands to actually be constant, they have to be within the same section. So I mentioned, I think several days ago, that um, when you're dealing with more complicated binary images, like if you have an ELF, you know, an XC file or an ELF binary or something like that, 
invariably they are constituted by different sections typically at least three that are actually like once you've done all your linking and and if there's no debug info or something like that there's usually at least three sections which is the text section the data section and the bss section for, which are contain typically uh, code uh, general data i think you have this on um code uh, data and uninitialized data uh, respectively and those can in theory be loaded at arbitrary offsets relative to each other in memory or the linker does something like that as well like the linker can relocate them uh, into different offsets and so if i subtract uh, say um, a function pointer which points to something in the um, in the code segment from a global variable which will live either in the data or bss segments because those se sections can be offset relative to each other um, the difference between them actually isn't a constant but if i subtract um, say two global variables, um, those will always be loaded at the same offset relative to each other, so they do denote a constant. Um, and so that's the idea behind this. But basically, uh, the thing that would have to change once we add multiple sections is that you are only allowed to subtract things in the same section to get a constant. Um, so you, ha you have to add, it's kind of like, you know, you can't subtract pointers of different types, uh, but it's not really the under, it's not the type of the data it points to, it's the, t the kind of section they live in anyway. Um, so that's the idea behind that. And, uh, and then what I did was, you know, I added, uh, we used to have a function here called parse m for immediate operands. And that was now replaced behind, by this parse const function, which does a general expression parse and then checks that the result is a constant rather than an address, for example, and then returns that. Um, and then in other contexts, like, um, you know, parse label, again, was previously kind of hard coded to just look for a label name, but now actually it just does a, and probably this would be renamed to something else now. But anyway, right now it just does a parse of an expression and it checks that the kind is address. And so, uh, but, but this allows the same syntax as before, but now with the ability to, to, to extend that. So um, just to show some dumb examples here. Um, of course, you could use literals as you did before because literals are a valid kind of constant expression. So that just works. Um, this is a good example. So um, you have these, there's this value here at a certain offset. Uh, so this is, so val is four bytes past uh, the pad label. And um, I mean, this is just some dummy code to basically make sure that if I add four to pad and store to that address, and then I load from that address using the direct label reference, then I get back what I, uh, I put in. So this is the thing that uh, loads 42 from that address, then doubles it from with a register to register op, and then it writes it back uh, using that store, using pad plus four, and then reads it, loads it back using just a direct label reference. So that's the sort of thing you can do now. Um, uh, another thing I added to go along with that is, um, this is conventional, every assembler has this. It has some sort of, magic token which uh, can be used to refer to the current address so wherever you are in in the assembler state um, you know the the address value at that point is something you can get with this magic variable and right now i just use um, use this um, i guess uses a single dot um, this is the convention from nasm and a bunch of old x86 assemblers so uh, this is what i'm kind of used to but maybe it's too confusing that it collides with this macro expansion character so maybe i'll change it but anyway um so yeah um i should also mention i added this debug feature which is a conventional assembler feature as well which is dot print which executes in the second pass of assembly where all the addresses are known and it basically will let you print some kind of operand and this is especially useful for just testing that all the expression evaluation acts as, as it should so you can see in this case here it prints before and then it prints the current um you know, essentially the program counter, the virtual program counter uh, that corresponds to where the assembler is in the assembly, um, and then does the multiplication and then prints it after. So if you look at um, this here and this here, this is basically like, uh, what is do mall, right? So it's going to be, the difference between them is going to be however long, this is this is a sequence of assembly instructions is. So if we, um, if we assemble and you can see before it's 80 and then after it's 116. So there's uh, uh, 36 bytes bit, uh, of, of, of instruction data between these two points. Um, and then you can do this. Um, so for example, you could do, 
I think I do this somewhere else, but you can do something like this. Uh, you can subtract the current value from some reference point. Um, and you can see this whole notation for labels with uh, forward and backward search for these numbered labels that works in, a, in an expression context. So if we do this, it should print. Oh, I forgot to, I forgot to recompile. Let's unload this so we don't have to uh, deal with that. Yeah, so 36, you can see. Um, those two operands are addresses, but then when we subtract them, we get a constant, and that constant is 36. So, th so this kind of stuff is often useful if you, um, like this kind of subtraction is often useful if you want to, for example, uh, suppose you have a bunch of data that you're initializing um, with assembly, like these kind of pseudo instructions that emit data, like dot .unt32, um, and suppose you want to encode in some other part of the struct the size of that data you initialized, you can just have two labels that reference the begin and end and you can subtract them. So, I mean, in, in this case, you can also, this would be another way to do it, um, is you could do, well, let's do it like, like this maybe. Um, something like that. Um, well, and instead of using you know, you could do, do it like that, especially if I reassemble it. That should give 36 as well. But you can imagine um, if you wanted to initialize some data here, you could do you could do this, right? So here we're just printing it just for debugging, but you can imagine if you wanted to initialize a field that is the size of something else, you can compute that size as a constant using this kind of trick. So that's a pretty common thing you see. Um, so you can do this for sort of ad hoc size of kinds of things. Static initialization of data, that's the most common case probably. You can also use it if you ever want to, I mean, this is pretty rare, but if you ever want to compute like relative offsets for doing, almost never need this, but if you want to ever like manually manually assemble instructions using yeah like i don't know self-modifying code or something weird sometimes you end up having to encode relative offsets and you can compute those relative offsets using that kind of technique as well but anyway um is that it oh yeah and you have uh like i said name variables and name variables works for both constants basically it works for any expression result so you can assign either a uh, a constant like one plus two or whatever or the difference between two labels you can assign that to variables but you can also assign address operands um, so for example here I'm just you know doing this but I could also do like that especially if I can remember to reassemble it um, so I guess yeah that's it uh, should be some 1024 stuff and then right so anyway, you can do that kind of thing. Um, that just works. So um, this is, I would say, reasonably close to, I mean, there's, actually the main thing I, I was in the progress of implementing last night but didn't finish before the stream was if, which is pretty easy. You just have to conditionally skip a bunch of stuff. Um, and um, that's really the main thing I, I want to put in the feature set that isn't already there, aside from stuff like, you know, command line interface and, and stuff like that, in terms of just like the basic features. Oh, and also the ability to like, you know, do dot include of another file and maybe dot include of binary files, which is uh, quite useful when you want to include binary data directly into an image. Um, aside from really easy stuff like that, um, this is this is basically it. This is what I envision for the initial version. And this is already pretty featureful in my opinion compared to assemblers I've used in the past. So um, anyway, that's what I wanted to go over. And boom, boom, boom. Let's see here. 
Oh, someone was uh, mentioning uh, that there's no short circuiting for the operators. Yeah. Um, right now, there are no side effecting. Uh, there are no side effecting things that can occur in an expression context, so I don't think that really matters. I guess, in a, I guess something like divide by zero, which is not really a side effect, but it's something that, um, you know, if you did, um, given the divide by zero is an error, I don't even know if I handle it right now. I do. So yeah, right now the lack of short circuiting would, would show up if you do something like this, either, um, well, something like this. Um, uh, the lack of short circuiting would show up in this way, but um, you're not really supposed to have side effecting things. Like side effects in an assembler are, yeah, a little bit, uh, don't really belong in an expression context. So it's really only for things that are potentially errors that would be observably not short-circuited. So I think that's probably fine. Um, let's see. But yeah, so now someone was asking if you can print registers. You can't because print is not acting at runtime relative to the program you're assembling, it's acting during the assembly of the program. So there's no register values at that point. You're just putting together a, uh, a stream of bytes that describes the, uh, the program image you eventually want to execute. So in our case, you know, we're assembling this string into a buffer, uh, and then we're running the emulator uh, using a RAM, uh, RAM buffer that's initialized from that assembled uh, byte buffer. So that's the idea. All right. Um, so today I wanted to, um, kind of return to the simulator and start adding more features. Um, so the simulator right now is intentionally very basic. Um, it supports the different instructions, I guess, except for e-call and e-break. Oh, and the fence, which the fence don't need to do anything right now because we don't have memory model stuff to worry about um, or any kind of caches that need to be flushed or something like that. Um, and so uh, I think it's just e-call and e-break, which I'm okay with. Maybe we'll get to that uh, tomorrow, but um, I'm okay with leaving these as is. The stuff I really um, want to focus on is uh, better kind of debuggability features. Actually, there's, there's, I guess there's three things. One is stuff like the uh, e-call and e-break, um, which also includes just exception handling in general. There are different exceptions that can occur as a side effect, of course, of normal instructions. Um, like, you know, uh, invalid memory access or uh, things like that. Um, illegal instruction right now, those are just ignored. Those are just skipped. Um, so things like that uh, need to be supported. Um, and um, you know the way that usually works, like Risk Five has a privilege spec which talks about how you're supposed to handle, or sort of different ways of exposing exception handling. Um, but if you want to do very basic exception handling support, um, typically what you do is you, uh, just like there is a normal expected control transfer. Um, with this next PC, you can set to whatever you want when you're doing branches. You know, an XPC by default is just the current program counter plus four, but then if there's control flow, um, these different instructions set it to something else, like wh to whatever target they want. Um, the most basic thing when you're doing exception handling is just to redirect the, the program counter's normal value to an exception handler uh, address. Um, and exactly how that address is chosen is there's a lot of design freedom. Uh, like I said, the privilege spec defines one thing, but if you want to do something very simple, you could just have a hard-coded address in memory that you always jump to. Um, and then you put in some of these uh, CSRs, which are these internal non-general purpose registers. You put some sort of description of the exception, like uh, an ID that says, 
uh, at the very least, you want to be able to distinguish different kinds of exceptions, like this is an illegal instruction exception, this is a invalid memory access or unaligned memory access exception, or whatever it is. Uh, so at the very basic, you want to have uh, you want to have a CSR that identifies the cause, and in the privilege spec, that's called the cause. So um, for machine mode, which is the most basic mode of execution, which is sort of intended for bare metal uh, microcontrollers and such. Uh, that register is usually conventionally called M cause, M for machine, and then cause for the cause of the exception. Um, and then there is also another, um, there is another uh, CSR that contains the equivalent of the link register for a function call and stuff like that. Um, so maybe we should do that now. Okay, maybe we'll do that today as well. But the first thing I wanted to do was more about um, kind of debugging and tracing. So um, right now uh, we have this uh, single step simulator you can call step and it steps it forward by a single instruction and that's about it. Um, and um, the way we are kind of, if you look at our uh, test here, the way we're visualizing the state is that we're just dumping, uh, we're just dumping the program counter and the 32 registers to standard uh, output um, kind of manually. Um, but it would be nice to kind of get various kinds of events from the simulator when interesting things happen. Like, um, for example, if you want to do breakpoints, um, you uh, would probably want a way of registering those breakpoints and having them um, be uh, be notified to the uh, to whatever whoever the the thing that is around the simulator, the harness or the driver or whatever. Um, and maybe you want to do that, you know, you probably want to do that not just for um, for instructions, but also for data. So you can maybe uh, set data breakpoints. Um, so that's the kind of thing uh, we might want to do. Let's see here. Um, and so that might be a good place to start in terms of new features to add is breakpoints. And let's start with instruction breakpoints, which is probably what most people associate with it. Um, now, instruction breakpoints, if you think about how they're normally implemented, um, I think I talked about this way back when we wrote the simulator, but uh, if you think about how things like breakpoints are normally implemented on x86, the conventional way of, of doing it is to overwrite instructions in place with um, like a software breakpoint like um, uh, in three, there's a single byte opcode, so you can you can overwrite the first byte of say a multi-byte instruction or even a single byte instruction with uh, in three, and then when that executes, it will trap into the OS, uh, the OS's interrupt handler, and that will ultimately transfer control to the debugger process, so it can inspect the now halted application process that's being debugged. So that's kind of how that works, and so um, basically before the instruction is executed. You transfer control to the debug the, the debugger process. It can then decide. Uh, it can look at the state of the, the, the debugged process and decide what to do. Uh, and then it can ultimately send some kind of go-ahead signal to continue execution. So that's a pretty standard semantics for that stuff. Um, because we're implementing a simulator, um, we can do that sort of stuff without having to overwrite instructions with uh, eCall or something like that. Like the equivalent of or eBreak would be the equivalent of int3 in RISC-V is something like eBreak. So you certainly could take that same approach. And if you're implementing a um, you know a debugger and software inside an OS, this is what you would do. But in our case, we don't have an OS that can kind of help us facilitate that kind of thing. This is you know this is bare metal essentially. There's no there's not even firmware for us uh, that could help right now. Um, and so let's just put those features in the uh, simulator itself. So we don't make assumptions about other software being present that will help facilitate the debugging. Uh, it's going to be a simulator only feature, basically. Um, and so um, let's let's think about how to implement that. Uh, the easiest thing to do, and there's um, there's different implementation choices, of course. Um, but one thing you can do is um, Is you can you can just have an address 
uh, let's call it just call it breakpoint for now and just to show you the basic idea suppose that you can only have one breakpoint enabled at a time um, something like this uh, and we could also potentially use a sentinel value if we can guarantee that that will never be used as a valid instruction uh, pointer but uh, let's just do something like this um, and so the idea would be um, if we are about to execute um, if we are about to execute something um, then well th there's an interesting question about where in the where in the process you call the um, the breakpoint uh, callback or uh, if it's not a callback like where you you transfer control back to the caller uh, signal the event or whatever but there's a there's a question of where do you do this now the the good news is that um, most of the side effects say to the program counter to the to set the new program counter is kind of delayed until the end so um, regardless as long as we set the breakpoint somewhere before um, the switch we we don't have any permanent side effects to the uh, to the state of the um, of the hardware thread the, the heart um, but you know the fetch instruction call can have some some internal side effects but typically those are you're not supposed to depend on this thing only being executed once for example um, so I think a good place to do this would be to actually put uh, breakpoints here because that way we can pass the fully decoded instruction to the breakpoint callback and I'm going to make it a callback just to start um, uh, because it makes something simpler and then I'll show you the transformations to turn it into more of a pull based API um, but the nice thing about callbacks is that we retain the program counter. We, we, we retain the execution state of the simulator, so we don't have to build an explicit state machine. Uh, but that's also a downside. Uh, the fact that it's callback based means that we invert the control of everyone who wants to uh, do a breakpoint handler. But anyway, um, let's just do a breakpoint handler to get started. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do something like this. Um, if, uh, if heart breakpoint enabled, um, and heart breakpoint equals program counter then uh, breakpoint handler uh, heart um, instruction um, yeah let's just pass a, a pointer to the instruction um, And so um, this is going to get called with a pointer to the assembler, or not the assembler, <laughs> uh, to the hardware thread. Um, you know, you probably want some user data as well as, as, as usual with these things. Um, and um, and a, uh, an instruction. And maybe I'll promote this to a uh, let's actually promote this. <clears throat> so an enabled flag and user data. Do something that's not a typo. Let's just destruct. So is it enabled? What is the address? And then for the callback, um, I mean, we can just call it callback. Actually, rather than passing user, user data per se, I'm just going to pass uh, a pointer to the breakpoint. 
um, because then if you want the user data, so I'm still going to leave the user data as a field in here. Um, but, um, you know, this way you can also get the address and you can see your own state and stuff. Might as well do it this way. Um, and then, yeah, we pass the instruction. And let's say it's a constant, right? Um, See, if the breakpoint is enabled and the address matches, then call the breakpoint callback, and that's it. Um, okay, let's um, try to remember where the main function is. Um, I guess we can actually, um, we can just continue using the stuff here and just kind of expand it with stuff we want to set breakpoints on. Um, so, okay, it looks like the simulator still works. Um, and, uh, right, so that's okay for now. Um, let, me, let me show you a trick for, um, So, you know, I don't anticipate using the breakpoint approach forever, but there is a way that you can, um, despite the fact that breakpoints are a pain in the butt and so on, there is a way that you can integrate callbacks into your code without inverting control. Um, and this is a trick that I first saw in the Emacs debugger, Emacs Lisp debugger. Um, but I've since seen elsewhere, and it's kind of worth knowing if uh, you ever have to to do something like this. So um, let's say I'm just going to stick it in this file for now. Um, but let's say you have I don't know. Let me call it debug loop, okay, or debugger loop. Um, the debugger loop is essentially this, something like this. Um, let's do that. Um, and so, so far so good, it's just the same thing. Um, okay. I'm just called command loop. That's what it is. Um, so we have a command loop, and uh, let me set the call back. So we haven't even enabled the breakpoint, but I just want to set up. Just want to set this up. Um, let's see if I remember. Will this work here? So, so, so the basic idea is to actually, this may not be a good idea for what we're doing, but let me explain the thought behind it. So, imagine you have this top level command loop, okay? 
So you do some init and then you enter the command loop. And right now we're just kind of single stepping, right? Like it waits for a key and then it steps next. Um, but like, you know, say we're going to make this like a, a simple command line interface to a debugger where you can type like continue or uh, you can print the value of different memory locations and you can set breakpoints and stuff like that. So I haven't done that yet, but imagine that stuff is here. But the point is that ultimately it will enter the simulator either when you print, you know, you, you type continue or something like that. Um, and suppose in the progress of entering the simulator in the, or sorry, not, in, in as, as during that uh, simulation, uh, it, it hits a breakpoint. Now, it's going to call into the callback at this point. Um, and one thing you can do is you can actually re enter the command loop. And um, so there's the outer command loop that's called from main, essentially. Then you enter the simulator. Then the simulator calls your callback your breakpoint callback, and then you you will print something like um, hit breakpoint, you know, something like this. Um, then you enter the command loop again. So now you have essentially two versions of the command loop on the stack, but the point is that they're basically equivalent because they both do the same thing. So it doesn't really matter that there's two copies, they do the same thing. Um, now at this point, the important thing to understand is that at this point, you can inspect through this command loop, the, the now the second command loop, you can inspect the state of the hardware thread. You can do all the normal things you would do from the debugger command line. You like you can print the current program counter. You can you can do whatever. You can do a bunch of stuff, um, and then eventually you can issue a command like continue. And in the context of there being a breakpoint, continue is going to essentially exit the outer command loop. Like it would it would essentially just like in Emacs when you type Q. When you have the was it the the backtrace like the backtrace window, it exits the nested command loop and returns to the original debugger where it was calling that callback, um, and it will then continue execution from from this point basically. Um, so, I think I'm going to show you how to do that, even though I mean it may not be the best way to do everything, and maybe it's not the right thing for us, but it's a. a one way you can take a debugging inter or a callback based interface and kind of wrap it up to something uh, without inverting control, basically. Um, and you have to be very careful you don't re-enter the simulator again. So that's one thing you have to be very careful about, basically. You have to be careful about not re-entering the nested command loop too many times because the like the, this code is not designed to be re-entrant. So the command loop is re-entrant, but the, the simulator is not re-entrant. So that's one thing you have to be very careful about with this stuff. Um, all right. Well, Okay, let's try doing something like that. Um, I, I was just sort of thinking about uh, I mean, this is going to be like the shittiest command interpreter of all time. Um, <clears throat> All right. Um,
first let's just do something like this um, without involving the breakpoints. Okay. Oh, not L. Now when you press enter, it should step. Uh, I guess this is not really, because it's line buffered, this is not really a good idea. Um, let's call this C. All right, so P prints the current state, and then you can Okay, let's just do this super crappy thing here. Um, Okay, so this is kind of the idea. Oh, right. This is, again, not, this is just a placeholder, but I want to show you that idea I was mentioning about the nested command loops. Um, So initially you're not nested, then you re-enter the command loop. Um, I guess what we'll do Do it like this. Let's just try this. Um, let's set a breakpoint. First, let's enable it and let's just say the address is zero. Just as an initial test. So it hit the breakpoint. Um, Okay, and so if you look at the stack here, we have the outer command loop, we have step, we have breakpoint callback, and we have the inner command loop. And so, um, just to show the point, if I now do P to show the current state, um, that's going to be executed from the inner command loop just repeat that without breakpoints. So we're now, we're at the breakpoint and um, we called into the command loop. So we were back handling the user interface, right? Like parsing commands and so on. If I now type uh, C, it should be nested. And so at that point, we actually, um, 
return from that breakpoint. And then we execute the instruction. And at this point, we should be one passed, one instruction passed. And if I type C, okay, now I should remove that, you know, where we're no longer hitting stuff. Um, so that's kind of the idea. I, I don't think I'm going to show you how to take this much further, but uh, I just wanted to show you that um, even with callbacks, you can do this kind of thing. Um, do I have Emacs installed so I could demo that real quick? Because it's maybe easier to show there. Maybe I'll install that in the background. Um, but yeah, anyway. So um, that's kind of one crappy, uh, crappy way, or not bad, crappy. You can you can make this work pretty well uh, of using breakpoints as a sort of, or using callbacks as poor man's coroutines. Because really, what you kind of want in terms of the control flow is you want the simulator to behave kind of like a coroutine where when it encounters a certain condition, it signals the caller to say, hey, I am at this point, what do you want me to do? And then depending on what the caller decides, it will then continue executing from that point. Um, right. Um, and of course you can do the same general thing for, uh, You can do the same general thing for uh, loads and stores. So if you want to have data breakpoints, uh, you can do the exact same thing as for load and stores. Um, there's a question with, with with any of this breakpoint stuff. There's sort of a question of do, does does the breakpoint logically occur before or after the side effect? Um, typically, you want it to happen before the side effect. Um, so for loads and stores, once you know whether, um, once you know what the address is, so you've computed the address, then you can check whether it matches a breakpoint. And if it matches a breakpoint, you can then call any callback or whatever signal it, however you want to signal it, and then resume um, and, and actually execute the side effect. Um, that reminds me of another issue with breakpoint handling is what can a breakpoint handler, you know, if, if you're used to using kind of debuggers, um, you're pretty much used to being able to do anything when the program being debugged is paused. Um, right, meaning in this callback, if this was a normal debugger, um, you would expect often to be able to set the program counter to any value so that this instruction that is being that, that is being hit with a breakpoint so that in theory you could execute any other instruction instead the way we're setting things up right now here is um, basically once this function is called in some sense is a foregone conclusion that the instruction is going to fully execute once you return from the callback because you know it's, it's going to fall through all this code um, that is probably not what you want necessarily. You probably want the ability to um, to control how that happens. Like maybe you can abort, you know what I mean? Like, or maybe you can restart or something like that. Um, so depending on, like in this case, it's callback based, but depending on the outcome of the callback, maybe, uh, you know, maybe it could be like, you know, breakpoint continue. You know, maybe it would be something like this, where depending on what the breakpoint handler says, you can either just continue or you can restart the instruction. Um, one issue with restarting is that you have to make sure that um, 
that it doesn't get hit again. Which is you can just make that the responsibility. Um, you can potentially make that the responsibility of the breakpoint handler to just make sure it doesn't get hit again. Like for example, maybe the implication is if you set if you say breakpoint restart, it's because you somehow changed the program counter and want that to be that want that change to be picked up. So that's one thing you can do. Um, the other thing you can do is to make it so that um, breakpoints are temporarily disabled basically once they re-execute. Um, and hence, anytime a breakpoint is hit, you always repeat, um, but then you make sure that it doesn't get hit the next time through or something like that. Like you can do it different ways. But anyway, for now, let's just leave it like this. Um, where you can kind of temporarily see what's going on, but you, then you have to kind of finish execution of the instruction. Um, let's see here. What else do we want to add or think about adding? Um, tracing is useful as well. You can do tracing by kind of the same kind of mechanism of callbacks. Uh, and I would say, unlike breakpoints where callbacks can be a little bit inconvenient for the reasons I mentioned before, you want it to act maybe more like a coroutine. Typically, with tracing, it's fine to use callbacks uh, because you typically don't. The, the tracer is not supposed to say ex change any of the state or alter how the execution is proceeding. It's just supposed to kind of record some data and move on. Um, so that's another thing you might want to add is the ability to trace, um, you know, to trace things. And so um, different kinds of trace points would be, uh, you know, like tracing all reads and writes. Uh, let's see, what do we want to do for that, if anything? I mean, we can do that in these functions here, for example. Um, Or maybe it's like, I don't know. Or maybe this is the store callback, and this is the load callback. Oh no, this is wrong. So this should be four, two, one. And this should be 
trace store callback. Trace load enabled. This is with this user data for now. So we are not really exercising it. Um, trace load callback. That's going to be a thunk. Um, and what was it? The first thing is an address, and then there's a size. Um, this is going to be the same sort of thing. But there's also data to go along with it. This command loop is already killing me. I think what you want is um, I guess there's already, what is it, get line from Uh, my brain's not working today for some reason. Um, I have to zero terminate it, um, but Do it like this. It's incredible. It's so fucked up in syntax. Um,
Um, Um, where was I? All right, trace points. Um, This is like the worst. Um, the worst command handler in the history of the universe. So first off, there shouldn't be any breakpoints by default, but if if I type B64, um, I guess B16. Um.
this socket here, to be honest. Yeah, this one. Trace load. It's working. Um, skipping in there. All right. Of course, all of this is kind of just stuffing those features in and to be flushed out more. Um, the other thing I wanted to do actually was uh, a simple um, visual disassembly thing. Or, um, because we, we have decode instruction, of course. Um, But it would be nice to have where's that code? Some print is a little bit annoying to work with for this stuff, but I guess it'll have to do.
sorry, this is going to be, I could probably automate this, but to be honest, um, let's just do it. Once and for all. Actually, let me do it that way. Yeah, unfortunately, that didn't work so well. Okay, let's do it this way. So up to name if up let's see if instruction up is greater or equal to num ops um, Um, let's get this list again, and this is going to be a little more. A little more clustered, I suppose.
All right, I think these are the classes to worry about. Um, no operands. Um, print immediate. Well, I guess we'll just use printf directly, to be honest. Um, Probably not. Let's just do the manual stuff in mind. Um, let's see. Let's print the offset directly for now. So this would be. RS1, RS2, and immediate. And this would be what is it? Destination. First is the destination. Something else. Something like that. And for these, I guess it's uh, this thing is for uh, this thing is first, and then source load state. working? Yes. All right. Um. Let's stuff these in for now.
Let's see if that works. Um, okay, let's just say So yeah, that's what I was going for. Uh, four. Why is JL printed that way? Oh, fall through. Uh, JAL, let's see here. There's a destination register. Then there is an immediate. There's a relative offset. Um, for J uh, for J A L R, it's R S one round, right? Um, So I, I think you want to pass in the program counter so you can do things in a PC relative way. Um, like for this, for example. And 
this as well. Okay, so it says JL, then it actually goes to that address. I think that's wrong, right? Because it says branch if not equal, X is not equal to zero, so it should go to, okay, no, that is the right one. That looks kind of like a bug, so AUIPC. Okay, so at the very least, there's this. Why is it loading? I don't know, AUIPC of zero makes perfect sense. That's really just a way of loading the program counter, but that still has meaning. Right, so x2, that means it should actually load a copy of the program counter, which is 80 to x2. Right. Right, this is just doing the PC route of load. All these minus values, by the way, are because the memory map IO addresses are at the top of memory, so when they're interpreted, in this relative way, I guess turn into that. So x6 should be 108. Yeah. All right. I mean, this looks reasonable. I think I'm going to stop now. It's been an hour and a half. Um, didn't get anything very technically meaty done today, and I can feel my brain being kind of uh, scattered more than usual. So uh, I think I need to do some planning for um, specifically what to do for tomorrow. But but anyway, yeah, this is a, this is certainly a good start at the kind of things I wanted to do, namely uh, more kind of instrumentation and introspection for the simulator and kind of building a debugger around it. And step one is to do this simple disassembler. Um, and you can see all it's really doing is gluing together existing functionality, like using the decoder to build a structured uh, representation of a function, and then using some tables and some case analysis to print the right things. Um, and of course, it's not going to be able to perfectly replicate the syntax of the assembler, but I'm trying to follow the general kinds of um, general kinds of, of notation, like the square brackets for these register indirect things. Um, 
actually, one thing I should do is this stuff here should be in square brackets to be consistent. Yeah. Um, so yeah, nothing, I guess, super exciting today, maybe. But um, we do have this line by line or instruction by instruction disassembler printing thing. Uh, and put some very anemic tracing and breakpoint stuff in. But I have to actually think a little bit about how I want to structure that in terms of uh, like what kind of events uh, the breakpoint handler can communicate back to the simulator, like re continue and restart, and how to handle those and, and whatnot, uh, and whether to continue with the, uh, the callback-based approach or probably more likely move to a more state machine style or coroutine style approach. Um, but anyway, so that will continue tomorrow. Uh, that was it for today. Oh, good point. Actually, before I do that, so I, I should note that before I shut off the stream, is that you're right, as in printf doesn't print what it actually, yeah, you're totally right about that. As in, yeah, of course, as in printf prints what it wanted to print, not what it actually printed. Um, I wonder if that causes bugs. It means that buff, yeah, it means that buff can end up past the end, which will then wrap around because this is unsigned. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, how do I want to handle this then? Yeah, I, I well. I should probably do something more general later, but you're right. For now, let's just do sprint up. And actually, probably the way you want to do this, this is the better way to do it. Let me make that change now and make sure I don't break stuff. Probably the better way to do this is to say that there's a precondition on print instruction that the buffer has to be some static size, and then you just have a static bound on the largest possible instruction. Do you see what I mean? Um, yeah. I think that's the way to do it. So like, because you can, you can statically guarantee that a single instruction won't assemble to more than say 100 characters. I mean, I don't know what the number is, but you can statically guarantee some number. And then you just make it a precondition of the function that the buffer has to be that large. Oh, I guess I still have to do this. All right. Yeah, OK, so let's call it a day with that. Uh, we continue tomorrow. I'll have more time to plan out architecturally. Uh, what to do for the simulator in terms of all that event handling and control flow stuff. Um, and even though, I mean, all of these things are small and piecemeal, um, they will start to add up to something substantial once we put it together properly. And it, it like, you know, you, you want to have something that feels like, to start with, uh, something that feels like, you know, GDB or something like that in terms of your ability to, to do things. Um, and uh, we're going to build it up in a library-based form where the command interpreter is just a simple wrapper around it. But uh, yeah, all these things are needed for that. Um, but anyway, stay tuned. We'll be uh, continuing this work on Friday.